Recently, Cardano founder Charles Hoskinson published a video arguing that the traditional financial system is starting to take over the crypto industry. And he's absolutely right. Now, crypto's implicit purpose is to replace the traditional financial system, but if it continues heading in its current direction, it could end up becoming even more dystopian than any central bank digital currency. That's why today we're going to summarize what Charles said in his recent video, provide some context for his claims, and tell you how crypto can protect itself from TradFi capture. I'll start by saying that nothing in this video is financial advice. It's purely educational content that's meant to assist you on your crypto quest. I'll also note that a few members of the Coin Bureau team hold Cardano's ADA as part of their crypto portfolios, and we're making this video purely because it's an important topic. If you happen to be interested in seeing which other cryptos we hold, as well as which ones we're watching, then you can join the Coin Bureau Club. Besides our portfolios and watch lists, members get weekly reviews of small cap altcoins that they vote for, daily crypto market updates, and exclusive crypto deals. The link will be down in the description. Okay, that said, the video we'll be summarizing today is titled, quote, Legacy is Eating Crypto. It was published by Charles earlier this month on his YouTube channel, and we'll leave a link to the video in the description. It is well worth a watch if you have the time, even if you're not a fan of Cardano. Now, Charles began the video by explaining that he's been discussing the importance of decentralized algorithmic stablecoins in recent interviews that he's done. He's also been underscoring the threats that centralized asset-backed stablecoins could pose to the crypto industry. This requires a bit of clarification. An algorithmic stablecoin is a crypto that maintains its peg to a fiat currency using, well, an algorithm of some kind. The most infamous example of an algorithmic stablecoin is Terra's UST, which collapsed in the spring of 2022. This, though, is actually not the kind of algorithmic stablecoin Charles was referring to. Rather, he was referring to a stablecoin which is backed by another cryptocurrency, such as MakerDAO's DAI, which can be minted by locking up another crypto as collateral, namely ETH. The catch is that DAI is arguably not decentralized, as it has since become mostly backed by centralized assets. This makes DAI not that much different from other centralized stablecoins like Circle's USDC and Tether's USDT, which Charles classifies as being asset-backed. That's simply because these stablecoins are backed by real-world assets, namely US government debt and US dollars, assets that can be easily seized. To put things into perspective, Charles provided a couple of statistics. The first is that centralized stablecoins make up around 10% of crypto's total market cap. Now, this doesn't sound like much until you realize the second statistic. Around 70% of all crypto transaction volume involves a centralized stablecoin. Naturally, Charles underscored the fact that centralized stablecoins like USDC and USDT are minted and redeemed by centralized companies that are often subject to strict regulations. He clarified that these regulations aren't necessarily bad, but mean that these entities are subject to government control. Crypto isn't. More importantly, it means that these entities can't push stablecoin innovation too far, as it would run afoul of regulations. These entities also can't issue stablecoins in a fractionalized way. In plain English, all of the stablecoins in circulation must be backed one-to-one -one by an equivalent value of US dollars or bonds. Now, this is a big problem because it means that centralized stablecoin issuers could theoretically decide which chain becomes the dominant chain in the event of a hard fork. Put differently, they would have to choose which chain to migrate all of their stablecoins to, as they can't just double the supply. Now, believe it or not, but this is something that was admitted by Ethereum creator Vitalik Buterin in 2022. He said that USDC issuer Circle could decide which chain wins if Ethereum was to fork. 
Notably, Cardano does not face this risk as it doesn't currently have any centralized stablecoins. More on that in a second. And by the way, if you're enjoying the video so far, feel free to smash that like button to give it a boost, subscribe to the channel, and ping that notification bell so you don't miss the next one. Are you ready for deals? Are you ready for trading fee discounts? Are you ready to save some money? If the answer is yes, then you're ready for the Coin Bureau Deals page. Yes, Coin Bureau brings you the very best deals and promotions in all of crypto. You won't find offers like these anywhere else. Discounts on the best hardware wallets. Trading fee discounts of up to 60%. Ugh. Coin Bureau's brand new altcoin focus subscription service. The Coin Bureau deals page is even better for you than this piece of succulent, protein-rich, nutritious grilled chicken. Ugh. Head on over to coinbureau.com forward slash deals or click the link in the description below. Don't delay. Check out the Coin Bureau deals page today. These deals are so hot, I need to cool down. Yeah! Now, after highlighting the fact that centralized stablecoin issuers could use their powers to require KYC at the blockchain level, Charles pulled up a series of comments criticizing the fact that Cardano doesn't have any centralized stablecoins on its blockchain, something we also pointed out in our recent Cardano review. Charles stressed that those who are blindly pushing for centralized stablecoins on Cardano are not thinking about the potential risks they could bring. All they care about is seeing ADA's price go up. And Charles used the response to the spot Bitcoin ETFs as another example of this thinking. He noted that the spot Bitcoin ETFs now hold over 200,000 BTC, worth more than $10 billion, and argued that the asset managers operating these ETFs now have as much power over Bitcoin as Circle does over select smart contract cryptocurrencies. This is both interesting and debatable. It's interesting because it's evidence that our prediction about Circle becoming one of the most powerful companies in crypto is coming true. More about that in the description. It's also debatable because controlling Bitcoin requires a lot more than controlling BTC's price. However, Charles argued that if the spot Bitcoin ETFs continue to swallow up BTC's supply, they could grow to the point that they could take control of Bitcoin in the event of a fork. For reference, BlackRock explicitly stated in its ETF filing that it would decide which Bitcoin fork to support if a fork occurred. So, imagine a scenario where Bitcoin forks into a proof-of-stake chain and proof-of-work chain. BlackRock and the other asset managers would almost certainly opt to support the proof-of-stake fork, as their large BTC holdings would give them de facto control of this new Bitcoin blockchain via their spot ETFs. I'll quickly note that these ESG-obsessed asset managers are concerned about the governance, that is, control aspect of Bitcoin, not its environmental aspect. Whereas proof-of-stake is lauded for its environmental friendliness, it's the control aspect that really matters. More about that in the description. Now, at the same time, BlackRock and these other asset managers could sell the proof-of-work BTC they hold after the fork causing its price to plummet to the point that it's unprofitable for every Bitcoin miner to mine. The practical effect of this would likely be the destruction of the proof-of-work chain. Charles then went on to remind everyone that it's not just stablecoin issuers and asset managers that could take over the crypto industry. It's also the centralized exchanges, where the top three control most of the trading volume. By Charles's estimation, there are just 10 entities that can control the crypto market. But if you think about it, it's actually probably fewer because BlackRock has a partnership with Coinbase and manages USDC's reserves. 
BlackRock also has significant influence within the US government, which recently settled a lawsuit with Binance that essentially gives it complete oversight of the exchange. In any case, Charles then said something fascinating, and that was, if you don't listen to what these entities say, they won't list your coin, and they won't launch a stablecoin on its blockchain. This makes us wonder whether this is in fact why Cardano doesn't have a centralized stablecoin. It refuses to comply. Case in point, Charles then said that Cardano is one of the few cryptos that's managed to evade capture by centralized stablecoin issuers and their allies. He said the result of this is that Cardano has been mostly ignored, and there's no denying that there's been a bias against it from certain entities in the industry. Charles reiterated that many in the Cardano community are growing impatient with ADA's price action and are, quote, trying to invite the vampires in so that ADA's price will pump. Charles said that it's not for him to decide, but they need to be aware of what they're in for, hence why he made the video. He repeated that if these vampires are let in, they will eventually be able to control everything about Cardano. In the same breath, though, he implied that ADA could be delisted if it's deemed not worthy by the TradFi-backed crypto elites, suggesting that there may not be a middle ground here. Regardless, Charles emphasized that everything in crypto comes with a trade-off. Nothing is free. He asked whether the purpose of crypto is to perpetuate the inequality we see today or to stop it. He also asked if crypto's purpose was to align with the entities who created this inequality or to get away from them. To drive the point home, he then said that every increase in centralization in crypto makes it more like the corrupt financial system it's trying to combat. This includes centralized infrastructure, centralized exchanges, and centralized stablecoins. Eventually, there will be wallet-wide KYC and CBDC integrations. I'll quickly note here that Circle CEO Jeremy Allaire tacitly admitted in an interview with Bankless that the endgame of Circle's USDC is to become a CBDC. If you've watched any of our videos about CBDCs, you'll know that they will give the governments and central banks total control over how you save and spend. Some would say that stablecoin issuers are exercising these powers already, but hey, let's not go there. Now, the outcome of this trend towards centralization will be the same kind of permission systems and deplatforming we're seeing in the financial system today. Look no further than the pandemic protests in Canada for evidence of that. Protesters and their supporters had their bank accounts frozen. Charles concluded by saying that crypto will mean nothing if it integrates with TradFi and that they will do everything in their power to ensure that it does, be it influencing regulations or otherwise. If you've been keeping up with our coverage of crypto regulations, you'll know TradFi integration is their goal. And finally, Charles recounted how the reason why Satoshi Nakamoto created Bitcoin was because of the unprecedented actions taken during the 2008 financial crisis and the precedents that they set. Satoshi's core belief was that crypto could be different, but first we need to acknowledge where it's staying the same. Unfortunately, Charles didn't expand on how exactly crypto could be changed to protect itself from creeping TradFi control, be it with algorithmic stablecoins or otherwise. Fortunately, it's pretty straightforward, but it's going to be much easier said than done and will come with trade-offs, as Charles said. This ultimately depends on your perspective. Allow me to explain. Let's go back to the premise of Charles's video, which is that legacy, aka TradFi, is eating, aka integrating, crypto and not the other way around. Many would argue that some degree of integration is necessary to increase crypto awareness, adoption and development. Crypto privacy regulations are a great example. Right now, crypto regulations around the world are incredibly hostile to privacy. In theory, that's because crypto privacy paves the way for illicit financial activity. In practice, though, it's because powerful financial entities 
want to see everything so they can control the economy and suppress their competition. The thing is that it's these powerful financial entities who want privacy more than anyone else. That's why BlackRock and the other spot Bitcoin ETF issuers didn't disclose which wallets hold the BTC backing their ETFs, and why Bitwise bit the bullet by disclosing this information before on-chain sleuths found it. Now take a second to ponder that stablecoin payments are likely to become common around the world because of lobbying efforts by stablecoin issuers like Circle. It won't take long for the average person to realize that everyone can see their stablecoin transactions and balances, and they won't like that one bit. Throw in the fact that central banks will be allowed to start holding crypto on their balance sheets in January 2025, and you have a recipe for immense regulatory pressure around increasing crypto privacy. This will increase the adoption of crypto privacy and spur the development of more privacy solutions. You see, the cool thing about crypto is that it's universal. The same rules apply to everyone who uses the blockchain. So long as that continues to be the case, then we will likely see a scenario where powerful individuals and institutions start to push for crypto values because doing so is in their own interests. If you're not convinced, consider the following. Central banks around the world are currently in the process of developing their own digital currencies. Do you think that these central banks will trust each other's digital currencies when it becomes easy to seize or freeze these assets at the click of a button? Well, the answer is no. There will be massive demand for a credibly neutral digital currency of some kind, particularly as we enter a more geopolitically fragmented world. Now, from our perspective, Bitcoin's BTC is perfectly positioned to play this role, and it's reportedly being used for trade by some countries already. Not only that, but some countries are reportedly mining BTC themselves. This has the potential to create a scenario where countries who use BTC for trade start to compete in mining to ensure that the Bitcoin blockchain remains neutral. Fidelity, another asset manager, actually predicted something along these lines. And this ties into Charles's claims about asset managers being able to control Bitcoin by controlling BTC's value. When you understand that BTC's biggest value proposition is that it's a credibly neutral digital currency that nobody can control, you understand that controlling Bitcoin would backfire. In other words, if BlackRock and the other asset managers were to take control of Bitcoin, then its primary selling point would simultaneously disappear. The consequence of this would likely be large outflows into other assets that asset managers can't control, such as gold and even other cryptos. Come to think of it, those outflows could even flow into the proof-of-work BTC fork. Now, it's also easy to forget BlackRock's enormous wealth and influence fundamentally rests on the supremacy of the US and the US dollar. If you watched our video about the BRICS countries, you'll know it is possible that we're entering a new commodity cycle that could increase the power of the BRICS. Now imagine a scenario where one of the BRICS countries launches a spot Bitcoin ETF for the proof-of-work BTC from BlackRock's proof-of-stake fork and gets tens of billions of dollars of inflows. I'm not saying that this will happen, I'm just saying that you need to zoom out and see the bigger picture in front of us. But of course, this is all long-term stuff, and it also doesn't account for the rest of the crypto market. In the shorter term, it looks like the rest of crypto could become integrated with TradFi in a very uncomfortable way. This was actually predicted by small blockers during the block size wars. If you watched our video about the block size wars, you'll know that TradFi investors once tried to take control of Bitcoin by increasing its block size. They failed and subsequently turned their focus to other cryptocurrencies, namely Ethereum. Since that time, it's played out like the small blockers predicted. Basically, if the goal of crypto is to compete with the traditional financial system in terms of things like speed and cost, then it will be a race to the bottom in terms of centralization. This is exactly what we've seen over the last decade. 
every next generation crypto has been more centralized than the previous one. Not surprisingly, the result is that these cryptos have become vulnerable to regulatory capture. As with BlackRock potentially controlling Bitcoin, centralized cryptos becoming subject to TradFi regulations will eventually make them no different from existing TradFi solutions, and nobody will use them. This is something that the investors in these crypto projects are presumably aware of, hence why they've been suddenly pivoting to become as decentralized as possible. If you watched our video about decentralization, though, you'll know that it's a lot more than just the number of nodes and validators. It's also the number of developers working on the blockchain, the distribution of the coin or token, especially for proof-of-stake blockchains, and even the infrastructure being used by the miners and validators. Obviously, the trade-offs of being decentralized on all metrics are slower speeds and higher costs. And this brings us back to the underlying issue, and that's that most of crypto is trying to compete with TradFi in terms of cost and speed. This has created a race to the bottom for centralization, and if it continues, someday the most adopted crypto will be run on a single server at the Federal Reserve. Now, perhaps we're mistaken, but that is not what crypto was supposed to be. So then, what's the solution? Well, in short, it's to let the crypto industry learn the importance of decentralization the hard way. As with most things in modern society, the only way you're going to get change is with some kind of shock. In this case, it could be Circle deciding which Solana fork wins in the future. It could be Tether freezing everyone's USDT holdings until they complete KYC. It could be Coinbase banning crypto transfers to and from personal wallets, like many regulators want to do. It could be BlackRock's spot Ethereum ETF taking control of Ethereum with all the ETH it will inevitably hold. Now, it's only once these sorts of things start to happen that the average crypto investor and user will understand the importance of decentralization. As I mentioned earlier, this is something many powerful individuals and institutions will start to understand too. And in the end, new, more decentralized cryptos will emerge. With a bit of luck, though, it won't have to come to that. The crypto industry will see these threats coming from a mile away and adjust accordingly. And there do seem to be some early signs of this, with new decentralized infrastructure, privacy protocols, and even algorithmic stablecoins getting VC funding. This is surprising at first glance, but upon closer inspection, it makes sense. Because at the end of the day, what entities like BlackRock, Coinbase, and Circle all want to do is make money, like most people in crypto. Investing in innovation tends to be profitable, hence why they've been pushing for pro-crypto regulations. Now, believe it or not, but it appears that it's the governments, megabanks, and central banks that have been holding crypto down. After all, they face the most competition from crypto innovation. So, it might sound crazy, but BlackRock and co. might actually be on our side in this battle, though we certainly wouldn't trust them. Seriously, ask yourself, what could be more profitable than replacing the governments, the mega banks, and the central banks. Food for thought. Okay, that is all for today's video, folks. So if you learned something new, let us know by smashing that like button. If you want to keep learning, be sure to subscribe to the channel and ping that notification bell. If you want to help others learn, then take a second to share this video with them. If you happen to be an active crypto trader or passive hodler, then you need to check out the Coin Bureau deals page because it has trading fee discounts of up to 60% and sign up bonuses of up to $50,000 on the best crypto exchanges, as well as the biggest discounts on the most secure hardware wallets. These deals are available for a limited time only, so do take advantage of them using the link in the description ASAP. Okay. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. This is Guy, over and out.